Alright, here we go. Take one. <laughs> You know, as addiction has no prejudices or biases, we're going to meet with a man today who was addicted to pain medications from an injury, but he held a position that could be very harmful to those that he worked with. He was a medical doctor who eventually ended up in federal prison. Now, I felt that it was very important to begin my questioning with how dangerous were you to your patients? Please stay tuned. It's time to get high while clean today. My name's Eric McCoy. You know, all of us in recovery have stories that may entail committing crimes to fund our drug use. I told my story in pain, failure, and misery are the stepping stones to success of those types of activities in my life. Many of those stories I kept to myself for a lot of years. And then even after my relapse, it was shame that kept those stories hidden for quite a long time. It wasn't until I reminded myself that the things that I did do not define me. And maybe I could be relatable to some. Once I decided to take that stand to fight the stigma of substance abuse. You know, I talk in depth about that in another episode that I called dishonest and criminals, is that who they really are? In today's show, I'm going to dip my feet into that stigma because for some, there is a belief that certain people, specifically with certain professions, are not susceptible to this problem. They can't be. Well, I want to say drug abuse that can lead to dependency is not prejudice nor bias. It could be your neighbor, could be your children, could be a lawyer, politician, or the profession of my guest today. Donald Gibson has quite a story of that person who, from my understanding, had an injury, was prescribed medications by a doctor that led to overuse, like many of the stories that we hear out there. The difference is that he was a doctor. Donald Gibson, just like myself, became wrapped up in behaviors that the stigma says he is a bad person. Is he? Or was he that doctor that had transformed into the Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde, as I described myself in the book that I wrote? I want to thank you, Donald, for joining me on High Wall Clean today, and I'm really glad that you have joined me today because this problem that we're discussing doesn't care that you're a doctor, and it's important, I think, for people to understand. This issue that arises is that, and this, and this is where we kind of run into you know, a lot of people's issues behind this is that doctors are classified as experts in the medical field. And I want to ask you a quick question before we sort of get into your story. How dangerous were you to your patients? Um, well, well, first of all, uh, thanks for having me today. Um, I appreciate being here. Um, at least initially, you have to understand this, this spanned over a period of 15 years. So, um, as with with any with many addiction stories, they they evolve. 
and they change. So when I first had my injury in 1995, uh, I, like you said, I was prescribed opiates and because um, I, I was in a lot of pain and I was never a person before that injury to ever take any type of pain pills, drugs, or, or anything similar. So, um, so, you know, I took them because I was in severe pain. I couldn't work. I couldn't sleep. And so um, that's when it started. And obviously, I never stopped taking the pills. I tried to taper off, but it, it, it you know, became a dependency, which led to an addiction. And in the initial, I would say the initial five to seven years, I functioned pretty well. I was able to work. I was able to take care of my patients. I was able to go to the hospital. No one was the wiser. You know, I didn't take a, a lot of pills to where I was like physically impaired, you know, stumbling or walking. Yeah, you know, I took like one or two at night to sleep and that was about it. So I wasn't, I wasn't a problem, I don't think, um, looking back. And then uh, my mother died of a prescription pill overdose in 2001. And then that kind of put me over the edge because I knew I was struggling with pills at that time. Um, and uh, I kind of blamed myself for her death. I was her son, the doctor. She was sick with a prescription bill addiction. I didn't know what to do. She dies and you know I, I blame myself. So after that, my, my uh, uh, addiction got worse. I took more pills. I took Xanax, Somas, other types of pills. And then at that time, um, in about 2005, I, I gave up my practice because like you said, I was, I don't know if I was a danger to my patients, but I was not a good doctor. Um, I was not, um, I mean, I showed up to work, but I was emotionally absent. Um, I, I was not really high all the time, but you know, I was, my mental state was not the best. So I, I gave up my practice and um, just took some, some other jobs. And um, that went on for another three or four years. And, and then by this time, my personal life, you know, suffered and I had a divorce and everything. But I don't, um, I, I was, after that, after 2005, I was never really engaged in a lot of direct patient care that you would th normally associate with a doctor. I wasn't going to the hospital. Um, I wasn't really taking care of sick patients. I was doing some social security physicals and they were just checkups and you know, they're, they're basically healthy. And so I, I wasn't really involved in direct patient care anymore. Now, had I had been at that time, I think they would have <laughs> because, you know, I wasn't a surgeon or anything, but if I was having to make critical decisions in a hospital setting, uh, there's no way I could have done that effectively. When you go to, when you go to medical school, yes, sir. How much do they educate on this issue? Okay, well, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, when I went to medical school in the 80s, uh, training in the mid to late 80s, um, I would say we had essentially no education in addiction. And I, I emphasize no, zero. We talked about alcoholism. And we knew the medical effects of alcoholism, how it affected people physically, but the mental side of it or the addiction side of it, no, we did not discuss, because frankly, we didn't know anything. Mental illness in the 80s was mental illness. It was, it was not a physical illness. Um, we didn't really know how to treat it. We didn't know what to do with these people. We put them in mental institutions and locked them away and said, you know, they're weak and you know, drug addicts, you know, all they have to do is stop and, you know, just just like that. And I don't think it was I don't think it was much better in the 90s, obviously, um, as far as, you know, my education and my, and my understanding of addiction. Um, so but of course, now there's a, a greater emphasis from what I understand in training and uh, people that train, you know, in the last five to 10 years, obviously, those doctors should understand addiction a lot better than they did in, certainly in the eighties. And um, I think they're better equipped uh, to handle patients. In fact, I think personally, I think if you do, if you see a patient the first time and you do a history of physical, absolutely you have to ask about alcohol and drug abuse. You know, I had an emergency room professor one time um, tell me that 
every person that walks through that ER door is on drugs or alcohol until proven otherwise. You know, we kind of looked at him and said, well, why would you say that? He says, because they're not going to tell you. They'll tell you everything else about them, but they're not going to tell you that they're an alcoholic or that they're abusing drugs because they don't want to admit it. So you have to assume they're on drugs or alcohol until proven otherwise. So you won't miss anything. So you won't miss a detox or a DTs or, or something like that. So, or the, or the people that are coming in to potentially self-medicate or get drugs from the doctors. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, um, so I think doctors nowadays are much better, uh, hopefully better trained and they understand addiction and, and we've learned so much in 20 years about the brain and the chemistry and the effects, the behavioral and er everything. It's just, it's, it's just light years ahead of the nineties. Uh, I can't even relate it. <laughs> so, so obviously since I wasn't well-trained in it, I wasn't prepared for the complications or consequences of my opiate use. And obviously, since I have a, a family history of drug addiction, that should raise my uh, level of suspicion as far as my, um, my effects with opiates. And I didn't have that. So um, obviously, people nowadays, if they're prescribed opiates, they have a heightened level of sensitivity. They understand the risks and the doctors have gone over the risks. They're given very short courses of opiates. They're monitored closely. You know, back in the mid nineties, I was given a prescription and that was it, yeah. you know, a month supply. Here you go. Here's a hundred Vicodin, you know, take them as needed. <laughs> as needed is it's a big, is a big open-ended problem <laughs> as it turned out. And it was so it was a lot easier back then to like use your pills and then go back to the doctor and say, I need more. And they would just keep filling them. Well, uh, I was not really. That's not what happened with me. Um, uh, being a physician um, in the 90s, I had access to opiates. In fact, if, I don't know if you remember, but the mid, the mid to late 90s, there was a flood of new opiates in the market. Vicodin HP, Lorset, Lortab, Oxycontin, and every time they came out with a new formulation, the drug reps would bring by samples and supplies of opiates. And that's where my opiates initially came from. In fact, they would bring me a stock bottle of 100 hydrocodone, and all I had to do is sign for it. You know, I just put them in my desk. And so, you know, I didn't have to go to doctors or anything like that to get, get prescriptions for many years. Mm -hmm. And um, so. So then it was in 2012 that you were arrested by the FBI for my right. understanding for uh, prescribing, authorizing medically unnecessary diagnostic tests. Correct. Uh, how did that play out? How did you get involved in that? And uh, do you think that played into your substance abuse problem? Uh, well, of course, of course. Um, as I said, um, as my addiction progressed, my, the implications to my behavior were problematic. Um, I became a poor doctor, poor husband, poor father, poor friend. You know, I wasn't physically fit anymore. Uh, you know, I was... And I was engaged in all type of high risk activities, of course. And um, um, so when I gave up my practice in 2005, six, somewhere in there, um, I had a couple of odd jobs here and there. And um, uh, I knew a lady that had a clinic that was open, that she opened, and she wanted me to be the medical director. And I said, OK, well, I'm not really working, so I'll, I'll do that. So I, I joined a diagnostic clinic to be the medical director. And um, uh, I didn't know this at the time, but they, they didn't have any patients. So what they did is they used marketers to go out and bring patients to the clinic. Okay. And normally that's, you know, it's, it's okay. But what happened was they paid, they paid the patients to come to the clinic, which obviously you can't do that. I mean, you can't pay people to come see you 
um, especially when they're Medicare patients. And so these were all Medicare patients. So you can't pay Medicare patients to come to your clinic. And then, so they did that. And then when they got to the clinic, I ran a bunch of tests on them that were not medically necessary. I mean, I allergy tests and x-rays and things they didn't, they didn't really need. So, um, you know, that's the definition of fraud. And so, um, you know, a couple of patients complained and the complaints got shot up to the FBI and they started to investigate. And, you know, it was, it was an open and shut investigation. It was not like I was trying to hide anything. And um, so the behavior, I mean, this is, this was a culmination of a decline in my, in my, my behaviors, obviously, you know, committing crimes. Um, you know, I was, I got involved with weapons. Uh, I was a, I was a federal firearms dealer licensed <laughs> who knows how I got that, but I was carrying a gun, you know, while on drugs, you know, the list goes on about <laughs> the number of things I was involved with, uh, you know, that were illegal, immoral, you know, just goes on and on. And so, you know, the question is, is why, why does, why did that happen? I mean, why, why did drugs change me so drastically? Because obviously before that, before the nineties, you know, I was stellar, you know, near the top of my class in medical school, had awards, scholarships, you know, just had tons of potential, and, um, you know, and was a great father and husband and, you know, had a great life started. In fact, it was a perfect life. I mean, I remember actually in 1995, after I married my wife laying down and, and, and just thanking God because I was so blessed. I had the career I always wanted. I had a, started a family. I mean, it was, it was literally perfect. I couldn't have dreamed of any better. And, um, and it changed in an instant with that, with that injury, literally in an instant. And, um, so, so I don't know, it's, um, you know, now we understand, now I understand why my behavior changed. I understand why the drug, how the drugs changed my, my central nervous system and what happened to, to, to that led me to actually, you know, um, exhibit those behaviors. And, um, and then, so I was eventually arrested, uh, the judge, that's when the judge sent me to rehab. The, ju the federal judge sent me to rehab, and that's where I got clean. Uh, I was four months in a residential inpatient facility, and uh, that was tough. I mean, I detoxed in a prison jail cell. Uh, I almost died. My kidneys failed. They had to send me to the hospital. I mean, it was, it was a nightmare, uh, literally. And um, so, but... So I got clean. I mean, that was actually looking back on it. That was actually the easy part. <laughs> Getting off the drugs just took, you know, a month or two and I was clean and my head started to, to come back and I started realizing. But as you know, um, once you once you detox and get the chemicals out of your system and your brain starts to heal, then your problems really start because now you have to deal with the consequences of your behavior that's gone on for the past 10 years, 15 years, loss of marriage, loss of job, career, prison, whatever implications, you know, uh, no money, uh, you know, I just, it all hits you, you know, and that is, that is very difficult to deal with. And it requires a lot of, a lot of therapy. How long have you been out now of prison? Oh, I was released in 2015 to to nothing i mean i had nothing i had nothing i had no no assets no home i was homeless went to a halfway house no car <laughs> no nothing <laughs> no family support really i mean my kids were kind of there but um and that's when things become really tough for a lot of people because you know a lot of people feel like oh my god i lost everything what's the point What's the point in, in a lot of times staying clean and sober? And, you know, because I knew that on my life on drugs, I had things. I could make things. Yes. I could do things that were illegal, you know, and, but it made sense to you at the time. And that's why it is hard. Um, yes. You know, I, I did a lot of custody time myself and, and I fell into the same thing. Um, the only difference is my, my family did stick around. Uh, I wasn't married or anything, but. 
mm-hmm. but you know, I'd lost everything and, and, uh, right. broke and, you know, <laughs> ended up in rehab and, and you do hit those points where you're like, what's the point? And yeah, I agree. I agree with you. Um, you know, fortunately for me, um, I, um, I never, I, I never had an issue with cravings or relapse on the drugs. Uh, I didn't, it didn't occur to me, you know, I, it, I kind of went back to the way I was before my injury. I, I never used drugs. I never thought about using drugs. I didn't like people that use drugs. And so after I was released from jail, <laughs> You know, I don't use drugs. I don't take pills. I don't, I don't do that stuff. So that part of me had healed more or less. Uh, but, um, but the consequences of the addiction is, um, you know, in a way it's, it's much more devastating, you know, especially in my case, because, you know, I have no job or career to go back to. And Yeah. When we were talking on the phone, I know you were saying that, you know, being in, Florida now you're in Florida yes um, that you wanted to you know be able to work in the substance abuse field and to help people and work with with people but Florida doesn't allow that yes yeah yeah, that's correct they have an they have a they have a state agency um, that screens everyone that applies to a social service type of job it's not just in rehab it's in the medical field the dental field uh, nursing homes any type of social services if you apply for a job your application has to go through this agency and they do a level two background check. You have to get your fingerprints and everything. So there's no way I I could pass that. And I had actually had two or three uh, rehabs that wanted to hire me. They certainly did. And they, they can't. So no, Florida is out and that's a law. So. Yeah. So that's what I was. And I'd like to kind of say this on here because, um, you know, we're, I'm in California and California has uh, different rules, obviously with doctors and nurses and, you know, people in that arena, uh, that does apply. You, you would be able to do that. But when it comes to the substance abuse field, they, um, there are certain offenses that do keep you from that very violent offenses or sex offenses, but in other areas, as far as criminal, and especially things that are related to your substance abuse, as long as you're clean, you've been clean, mm-hmm. uh, you go to school, you can become, you know, get the education, become right. a counselor. Now, if you do get arrested while you're certified, you will probably lose it. You may Correct. never get it back at that point. Correct. But yeah, it really depends on the state that you're in. And obviously, it sounds like with uh, Florida, you're in one of those states that is going to keep you from doing that. That's correct. So, um, you know, when I, when, when, I, when I got out, that's obviously that was my logical choice is was to somehow get into the addiction field and, you know, um, educate myself and, and educate others about like you said, that, that addiction can can strike anyone, anywhere, anytime. And, um, you know, um, but now we know so much more. We know how to, we know how to basically, not how to prevent it, but we certainly know how to be ready for it. Uh, we certainly can diagnose it quicker. Um, you know, our, our suspicions for, for, for behaviors are, are much better attuned to addiction and alcohol abuse. And we have much better treatments we have much better recovery and um, and long term recovery rates because of that. So I, th- I thought it was a great fit for me, you know, being a physician and an addict and the whole thing. I said, you know, just you need to go into substance abuse field in some form or fashion. Um, but uh, it's just not going to happen in Florida. So I have to move <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> well, you know what, though, that's great because, uh, you know, you are an expert in the, you know, in, in understanding this, I mean, from a, you know, experiential knowledge, you have plenty of it. Right. Um, obviously you do have knowledge in the medical field, not specifically with substance abuse. Uh, mm-hmm. But, you know, to me, that's exciting. Though, and I like the fact that, you know, you are passionate about it. And yeah, I know we were talking on the phone and you were saying that you had lost your passion in life. Yeah. I mean, um, that's 
That's true. Um, I think it's still in there somewhere, Eric. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, but uh, I've, I'm not the same person, obviously, as I was before this experience. And, you know, and it's not just the, the drug addiction that I'm recovering from. I'm recovering from everything else that happened. You know, when you lose your family and, you know, your lifestyle and you go to prison and, you've, you you know, you have to survive that. And, you know, all these things I have to deal with. If it was just the drugs, that's easy. You know, but, it's, you know, that I can overcome that. And I, and I have. And, and, and but the other things, I mean, I, I got the IRS, I owe a million dollars to. I mean, it's just it, everywhere I turn. You know, I have restitution to pay $3 million. I mean, just everywhere I turn, you know, those things are there. And it'd be nice to say, well, just put those out of your mind and get to work. Well, it's not that easy. <laughs> it's not. So overcoming the consequences of your addiction sometimes is, is the most challenging aspect of recovery. And um, so, you know, I've tried to rebuild my relationship with my sons, but you know what? it always sticks in my mind. What do they really think? <laughs> you know, what did they really go through when I was in jail? You know, and what, how did, how does a child deal with that? You know, and they lost their home, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, I worry about that all the time. It's, it's, it's pretty devastating. I think the, I think the more important question is how do you think about yourself? Um, well, I feel like I still have a lot of potential. You know, I, I, you know, like I see, I do have, I do have, I think I do have some, uh, some passion to, to help people still like I did before. Um, uh, I just want to fi find a venue where I can do that, whether it be a recovery coach, a counselor, a peer support, you know, do research, you know, work for a nonprofit, a government agency, uh, whatever. Uh, you know, there's something I can certainly do. Um, you know, while I'm still relatively old and young. <laughs> so, um, so that's, that's what I'm kind of trying to look for. But, you know, my, my situation is not where I can just pick up and go to California. You know, I, sure. wish, it was, I wish it was that easy. Um, uh, so, um, but it's, it's still possible though, if I had, if I could, if I could come up with a venue and say, well, Hey, you know, you would, you know, you do great doing this. I certainly would be open to it. Um, I want to get my certificate as a recovery coach. I want to finish my education as I started an education as, uh, for the Florida Addiction Academy. It's called CAP, Certified Addiction Professional. So I've done about half of that. I've kind of laid back a little bit because, you know, I don't know if I can get a job using that, but and it's expensive too. So, um, but I want to continue to educate myself and hopefully I'll find a a role somewhere. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I'm a counselor, I'm a teacher. I teach at a school for right. people that are working to become substance abuse counselors, <laughs> which is ultimately what you need to get into. Right. And, you know, I have been in recovery for many, many years. And, you know, there's a lot of things that I learned in my experience and you know, you kind of talking about, you know, your past and all the stuff that you're dealing with, you know, it could be shame and guilt and regrets and, you know, and all those right. things. One of the greatest and most important things that I worked on and I felt was so important was self-esteem. And I got to a place where, you know, I could look at all of the things that I did and I did a lot of bad things myself. Um, mm -hmm. And I got to a place to where I was able to say, you know what? There's nothing that I've done that made me who I am. That's not who I am. You know, I'm not my actions. I'm the one that's done those things, but that's not who I am as a person. Right. We talk about this concept of learning to transform our past where I can say, you know what? Okay. Nothing that I've done makes me who I am, but you know what? There are some of those things that do did help shape me based on knowledge and experience. And I love who I am today. Mm -hmm. And it's a way that we ultimately can learn to transform our past and make it into something that's useful and helpful for us. I love myself today. And, you know, you're sort of in that journey of figuring out, okay, where do I go? What do I do? 
you know, what's my purpose in life, which it sounds like you've sort of, you know, defined it in terms of what you ultimately want to do. Now you're going to have to be creative <laughs> because of the situation you're in. You know, you talked about uh, the concept of writing a book. Correct. Yes. Putting your knowledge down there and being able to share with people your experience, what you went through and how you can move beyond that. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you're, you're right. Exactly. I, you know, obviously I'm, I'm struggling. I mean, my self-esteem is obviously not what it used to be. And I struggle with motivation. You know, I mean, Jesus Christ, I, I do, I do DoorDash to make men's eat, ends meet, you know, and um, I certainly have to swallow some pride delivering food to people. <laughs> Maybe that's what you need right now. <laughs> So, um, but I am providing the service. <laughs> so, um, so it's, it's tough. It's just, it, you know, it bothers me. It bothers me every day, but, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the type of person that, that just, uh, you know, I, I, at least I used to be very persistent and, and successful in achieving my goals. So I just really need to, to, you know, lay out my goals and, and, and pursue them the best, the best I can. Um, and uh, just just pray and and hope for the best and um, you know try to help other people because I know that people that and one of my one of my ideas I've had it was that I'd like to work you know with, in a rehab or recovery center that that kind of caters to professionals doctors lawyers nurses judges you know not not just in the healthcare but you know any kind of professional whatever. Um, because, you know, I think that, um, you know, I could, um, I could help them understand how does this, how do these things happen? Because, you know, when you're, when you go to rehab, your, your mind is so messed up. You wonder why, what, what happened? What, well, this is what happened. This is what happened to me. This is what happened to you. Okay. And this is how we fix it. Okay. And um, I think I could uh, provide a lot of insight and uh, to the, to the, professionals that struggle with addiction and uh, help them understand, um, you know, so I'm still hopeful. Yeah. I think the humility part for that arena is probably the biggest struggle. Correct. You know, I, you know, I was this and now I'm feeling like this, even though exactly. you're not exactly you're not down here. That's exactly. just the way you feel. That's right. That's how you feel, you know, it'd be like, you know, it'd be like a judge becoming a clerk. <laughs> it's, it's, it's difficult to swallow because it hits you in the face every day, you know? Um, and it's not like you can get that life back. So you, like you say, you have to reinvent yourself. You have to, you know, step out of the box and, and kind of, um, you know, be open-minded. So. In, but 2000, yeah, in, two, in 2000 and, uh, and two, was when I had gotten clean mm -hmm. and I had 11 years clean and sober in 2013. And between the 2002 to 2013, I was a counselor. I became a program director, clinical director, executive director. And mm -hmm. then I relapsed in 2013. Mm -hmm. I ended up going back into rehab. I went to Tarzana Treatment Center in Los Angeles. Right. And it was the most humbling experience ever. You know, I'm back sitting in a group, listening to people teach the same stuff I've taught. You right. know, right. Um, yeah. and it was so humbling. <laughs> I know. I, I, I certainly know how you feel and how you felt. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's great. So I would, you know, I'd like to, you know, set myself up to pursue it, you know, a similar type of path, you know, get, get to get in the, get in the industry, you know, start from the ground up if I have to, you know, as a tech or an aide or a counselor or, or whatever. And, um, and just start learning how to help people again. So in, in Texas, you, you can't eat, or I'm sorry, Florida, in Florida, you can't even, um, work as a, a support staff nope. or anything within the industry at all. 
Nope. If I was rich, I couldn't even own a clinic because you have to have a license to own a clinic. And so when you apply for the license, they do a background check. So, um, so no, I, there's, I can't do anything in Florida as far as I know. Um, is there a way to meet with the board? Uh, I checked into that when I first got here, they have a, a certification board. Um, and, um, I, they, they, they have waivers for certain people, but I'm not eligible for a waiver because I have restitution that I have not paid. <laughs> so, so it's like voting. If you have restitution, you can't vote because you're, you're in Florida. That is because you, you've technically not satisfied all your requirements because you still have restitution. You know, so, so, um, so no, I'm not eligible for a waiver for the Florida Board of Certification for any, any position. I couldn't, I couldn't be a tech or anything. Um, and um, so, but, um, but like I said, I, there's other states, I think that certainly would be, you know, a better fit for me. I think yeah, all you got to do is just research, research uh, each right. state. Uh, certifying boards and find out what the requirements are uh, for for those different states. Every state has different um, requirements. There are, you know, national standards for uh, treatment programs mm -hmm. um, and sort of things that have to be have to be done. But um, yeah, as far as the certifying boards, there's different standards, and you just have to kind of research it. I think you'll find it. I yeah, think I you so. will. The, the, the first statement that you made, Dr. Jekyll and Hyde, that was, that was apropos for me. Because, I mean, I was up here in 1995. And by 2010, I was, you know. Doing bad stuff. I was, I was not of this world mentally, I'll tell you. <laughs> And I moved out and got a condo and just went to strip clubs and I didn't see my kids for weeks, months at a time. I mean, who the hell does that? I mean, it just, I look back on it and I just, it's hard to, hard for me to believe that I lived it. it. It really is. There were so many things that happened. That you wouldn't believe some of the stories. Um, it's, it's just, it's wild. Um, carried a gun the whole time. I mean, really? <laughs> I was committed. I was committed at one time. They actually committed me to a mental institution. Or danger to self or? Uh, I don't remember. I was, um, uh, th this was, this is, this happened when I was, I was served with divorce papers and I kind of lost it mentally. I said, what, you know, so I called a friend of mine and I said, just check me into the hospital. There's something wrong with me. My wife wants to divorce me. I don't know what's going on. Even I couldn't put it together. So I self-admitted myself to a mental institution. And I started a detox immediately because they, they take your pills away, right? So I started a detox immediately and, and just a big, bizarre three weeks. I, I went to two or three different ERs. I was, yeah. and I must have said something to one of the mental health providers that he thought was dangerous. So they called the constable. He showed up. I was ready to go. And the nurse said, you're not going anywhere. You're going with this constable. And he took me to another facility, a locked facility. And I was, I was committed. And, um, but I escaped. <laughs> Literally, wow. I escaped. Yes, I escaped. Uh, they took me to the ER for some other reason. And while I was in, they, they took me to my hospital ER, my old hospital ER. Yeah. And I overheard them saying that, that after my treatment, I was going to go back to the mental institution. And I said, no way. So I, I locked off my IV, got dressed and walked right out of the ER, circled around the whole complex, which I knew, and went to a, uh, my old professional building, called someone and they came, picked me up. And the cops were looking for me everywhere. Five cops showed up to my house and uh, wanted to know where I was. So I checked myself into another hospital in the medical center and I got some decent treatment. 
and I was released and went back to the same thing, believe it or not. But you know, it's interesting during that whole time, no doctor ever came in and said, you know what your problem is? You're a drug addict. That's your problem. You don't have some bizarre intestinal illnesses. You're not out of your mind. You are a drug addict. And they did not do that. Remember what I said about my ER professor? Assume that everyone is on drugs or alcohol until proven otherwise. Yep. Nope. I had depression. I had psychosis. I had paranoia. I had all these things. And I actually gave him a list of the medications I was taking. Hydrocodone, Suboxone, Xanax, Clonopin. It doesn't take a rocket science to put it together. <laughs> how many How many doctors would you say? I just want a, a percentage yeah. of how many doctors do you think are on drugs? I guess I would initially I would think it'd be low. I mean, single digits. You know, I'm not, I don't know the actual percentages, um, but nowadays I would think it's low. Now there's probably a, a greater instance of doctors that have alcohol problems. I would imagine. Um, but, uh, I, I, I can't really guess on the percentage. I, I don't know, maybe, you know, 5%. I don't know. Um, I know 20% of the population is as 20% of our population is an addict in one form or the other 20 million people. Um, and so, you know, professionals are a significant percentage of that. Um, I, it, just in my experiences here, my and and when I uh, do on my my Facebook addiction groups, there seem to be more nurses, at least that are out there, struggle with addiction problems. And it's interesting that most nurses can actually get back into their profession unless they unless they get arrested. That's that's correct. Yeah, unless they have a you know, I said I guess it depends on what type of crime it is, but. But um, I, 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 I conversed with one lady that did have a criminal record and she was able to get her license back um, in, in some, some in state, Florida? Michigan or something. I don't know which one it was. No, it was Michigan. Okay. And so uh, I don't know. It, it, could, it could have been just a misdemeanor or something. I don't know what it was, but um, she was able to overcome that. So. <laughs> so, hey, I always like to ask the question, um, what, is there anything that you'd like to talk about or, or mention um, if that I haven't asked any questions on or that you haven't talked about? Um, no, I just want to, I just want people to understand that um, kind of like what you said, that, that um, our addiction, our drug use doesn't, didn't define us. You know, it wasn't who we are. Like with, with many people, you know, drug use and, and, and alcohol, drug use especially, it, it's, it can be accidental, like an injury or surgery or, you know, an illness, something, you know, when you take the drugs and, you know, you fall into this, into this addiction. Um, so um, I just want, um, I just want to, um, to, to, to help people understand um, because I think that the stigma of addiction and the behaviors of addiction is still pretty pervasive, you know, and, uh, I don't think that, um, I don't think if you're an otherwise good person that the be your behaviors during your addiction should define you. Um, I, I really think that, um, I, I would like to make people aware of that. Okay. Um, and just understand, you know, I would think that, you know, it's interesting you say that, that you know, being, being, uh, being, getting back in the medical profession, obviously it's not going to happen for me, but, you know, I would think it should be just the opposite. It should be easier because the medical profession should understand that your drug addiction didn't define you. You know, I, I had 50 years of stellar behavior. I just didn't turn into this person at age 50 for no reason, you know, um, well, there, well, there is a, there was a reason. So, um, I think that the, the years, the years of your addiction, um, should not, should not define you at all. Um, I think it's, I think there, I think there are certain things that are difficult to overcome, but, um, I think that, um, that uh, people need to understand, understand that. When we do drugs, you know, we, our values go out the window, our morals go out the window. I mean, Thing goes out the window because our whole focus is on 
making sure that I have supply, that I make sure that whatever it takes, that's, that's where we fall into the, it's the whatever it takes to make sure that I have those things that my brain, you know, we talk, we, we look at the old part of the brain, you know, the old brain is that part of survival. That's where the pleasure, that's where our emotional, you know, and our emotional memories come from. Yes, it's, it, you're exactly right. And it is the old part of the brain. We call it the paleocortex, the basal ganglia, the, the limbic system. These, this is where our reward system or our reward circuits are located. And um, our cortex, our new brain, is, is where our thinking brain, where we reason and make decisions and all that kind of stuff. And um, so what happens in addiction is that our reward system overtakes our brain and shuts off the cortex. It's called hypofrontality. Your frontal lobe it becomes less effective. And there's been studies in criminals uh, for, for decades about hypofrontality and criminality. And it turns out that criminals outside of drug addiction have a underdeveloped frontal lobe. And so they have, they're born that way. They're, they're, they're born that way. They're born with this area of the brain that doesn't function happily. So, so drug addiction is essentially a uh, self-induced hypofrontality. You take the drugs or the alcohol and the cumulative effect is like you say, you have no morals, you can't make the right decisions. In fact, you're gonna make the wrong decision practically every time. And um, it's because the reward system is so strong. You know, I thought about this one time and I, I think, was trying to think of something where, where this could happen where the person is not on drugs. And I thought of a situation, if someone came in your house and took your child and put a gun to their head and, and told you, I want you to go rob a bank or I'm going to shoot your kid, what would you do? You'd go rob a bank in an instant. You wouldn't even think about it, even though you know it's wrong, you know it's illegal, but your instincts have taken over. Your instinct of self-preservation and, and to save your child has taken over and driven you to make the, that decision. Okay, and so, so instead of the man with the gun, you put drugs in there, and drugs—that's what drugs do to your brain. Your your reward system, your instincts are so strong that you're always going to default to that. I need the drug. I need to get the drug. I need to do this to get the drug. And, and so forth. So that's how I kind of relate to it. <laughs> hey, I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for coming on here. Sure, no problem. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in to another episode of High Wall Clean. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. My website is highwallclean.org. Again, you can always reach me at emccoy at highwallclean.org. And again, I want to thank you guys all for tuning in. I'll see you guys soon.